Mm -hmm. Good day, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the CMI School of Christ. And we're going to continue with our classes, The Great Mercy of God. And during this class, we're going to look at Righteous Lot and the Veil. <clears throat> and before I begin with our notes, I want to just read uh, something from an email that I, that I sent in response to an email that someone sent me. And uh, they were basically just, you know, sharing the heart and the Lord. And it encouraged me and it, it actually like spurred uh, this response. But I'd like to go ahead and read this. Uh, anything that directs the heart unto Christ is serving the purpose of God. Many times we do not understand that everything of this world is opposed to this, including the religious mind of the Christian. <clears throat> it is easier to get involved with a religion than with a person. We can memorize and learn a doctrine or teaching and then try to live according to those standards because it is something that we, man, can try to do. But to know Christ Jesus himself, we must surrender ourselves of our own ability and fall upon the mercy and ability of the omnipotent El Shaddai. What man cannot do, but what God alone does. And this, brothers and sisters, is a blessing to be in such a state of a sure hope, a sure expectation. <clears throat> now, with that, let's continue for this class looking at righteous lot and the veil. Now, in our few previous classes, we were looking uh, basically kind of, you know, and some of them comparing and contrasting uh, Abraham with Lot, uh, or Lot with Abraham. And uh, I basically kind of summarized uh, the passages from Genesis chapter 18 with Abraham and the, pas the passage in Genesis chapter 19 with Lot and with this right here. And this is for Abraham <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 18. The appearing of the Lord is unto the one whose heart is abiding in the day, the blessing of a fuller, more complete, more perfect knowledge of Christ the Son that comes with his very appearing. All right, so basically, uh, those whose hearts are turned unto the Lord abiding in the day, every appearing of the Lord is unto this uh, more fuller, more perfect, more complete knowledge of Christ himself. And it is our rejoicing, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> and so, uh, with, with Lot in Genesis chapter 19, uh, this appearing of the Lord, because when, when the angels, you know, come to Lot in Sodom. This appearing of the Lord is unto the one whose heart is abiding in darkness, because they came in the evening uh, at nighttime. It is judgment upon one's own ignorance unto deliverance of life. And that's exactly what happened with Lot. The Lord is the one who brought him out. All right, and so I, I've looked at just up to where we've been with Genesis chapter 18, and then I, while looking at searching something, <laughs> I can't remember what I was searching concerning the passages <clears throat> with Genesis chapter 19 with Lot, but I came across this passage in Luke concerning Lot. And so uh, this is Jesus speaking concerning Lot. And I went ahead and kind of backtracked a little bit to get some, somewhat of the context of it. And the, the context, or I'll just, I'll just read what my Bible had as a subtitle. It's the coming of the kingdom. Well, it's the coming of the kingdom of God, to be precise. And so this is Luke chapter 17, verses 20 through 25. <clears throat> now, when, and this is just to give us kind of like a background for what Jesus is about to declare concerning Lot. Now, when Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. 
nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Verse 22, then he said to his disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them, for as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. <clears throat> and so there's, with, with reading that, there's basically three things that caught my attention. I'd just like to share those real quick. Uh, for one, the word observation, Parateresios, Strong's number 3907. And this is just the uh, Strong's Greek dictionary for that word. It is from Strong's number 3906. Uh, and it's, it, the definition is inspection, that is ocular evidence. And ocular evidence is basically that which the natural eye can perceive, that which the natural eye sees. <clears throat> and that was uh, Strong's dictionary. And this is Vine's dictionary for the same word. It says, attentive watching, akin to parateo, to observe. It is used in Luke chapter 17, verse 20, our exact reference that we're looking at, of the manner in which the kingdom of God, that is the operation of the spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men, does not come. And here's how it does not come. In such a manner that it can be watched with the eyes, and I put in with the natural eyes. And that was from, uh, I guess, a quote from Grimm and Thayer. Or as a King James uh, Version margin, without outward show. Something that would grab our attention outwardly. And there was a translate, a Span there's a tra Span Spanish translation, and I couldn't quite find the, the equivalent in an English translation. But this, this uh, versión moderna, modern version, I guess, Spanish translation says the following, with external manifestation. And one of the things that I just want to make mention <clears throat> is because, as I, as I stated, in, in looking at uh, where Jesus is about to mention Lot, I wanted to get a little bit of the context of how he brings Lot into the picture. And well, a little bit of the context is, is starts with verse 20, but if we go before that, Jesus has just finished healing, I think it was uh, the ten lepers. And so, here is one, listen, here is one, in fact, the only one who is doing miracles, signs, and wonders to present to all who are present that he himself is indeed the Messiah of God, the Son of God. Every single miracle, every single sign, every single wonder, every single healing was to show and to openly make known that he, Jesus himself, was the Messiah. And so here are the lepers within, I mean, it's... <laughs> The lepers who represent the whole entire race of Adam, the whole natural creation, the whole Adamic man, having no life whatsoever. And here it is seen in a form of leprosy, death, and yet moving about, and yet death. I mean, it's a sentence of death and decay. And so, like during those times, if, if you were a leper, you had to stay your distance and you basically had to warn people you were coming. So people would get out of the way. Well, the lepers were in this condition in the first man, Adam, and the people who did not have leprosy were also in this first man, Adam. It was still the same condition. <clears throat> Jesus was not in that condition. Death did not overpower him. Death does not overpower life. No one could touch a leper. 
You couldn't touch a leper. You couldn't touch an, a quote-unquote unclean thing, lest you become unclean, lest you become defiled. And here shows Jesus. He, Jesus shows up doing what is it completely impossible by the ability of man. Instead of death, this condition of death affecting him, no. He himself who is life changes the condition. And in testimony, bringing one from a state of death to a state of life by healing the lepers. <clears throat> Of course, we know there was only one who came back to give glory to God, and that's what Jesus said. I mean, he was surprised. Weren't there, weren't, where's, where's the rest? Has only this stranger come to give glory to God? <clears throat> and so, this is a little bit more of the context. So, Jesus has just performed a sign, a miracle, a healing, basically showing himself that he is indeed the Messiah. All right? <clears throat> And so, where were we? In such a manner that it can be watched with the eyes. As the King James Version, the margin says, with outward show, with external manifestation. And so, let me read the verse again in Luke. Uh, when they asked him, when the Pharisees, specifically the Pharisees, that's just, that's important, the Pharisees, when the kingdom of asked him when the kingdom of God would come, he answered and said to them, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Okay? <clears throat> now going on. This is still looking at the same word, observation. Parateresios. Uh, complete this is this is a complete biblical library, New Testament Greek English dictionary. And <clears throat> For the classical Greek, it says the following, a, a late Greek noun, parate, parateresis, combines para, beside, with teresis, custody, keeping, or observance, and means, basically those two, two Greek words combine means close observation or scrutiny. It is used in Greek literature of physicians carefully watching symptoms of a disease. <clears throat> and so, it basically is the signs of something. They're watching the signs, the progression, the signs of something coming to a particular point. All right? It goes on with the same uh, dictionary. It goes on now as far as like the New Testament usage. Luke chapter 17 verse 20, exactly where we find this word, <clears throat> it says, is the only New Testament passage to use para This is the only passage in the New Testament that uses this particular Greek word. And it goes, goes on to say, one possible point being made is that even careful obs observations, very careful, just as a, like a physician, very careful observations of visible Events, visible with the natural eye, visible events will not reveal the coming of God's kingdom. Perhaps, however, a pun is being made on parateresis. It, is, it may also suggest that the kingdom does not come through observance of the law. Specifically, the Pharisees were strict in their rigorous observance of the law. I mean, <clears throat> Paul, according to the law, he was perfect. I mean, they would try to follow it to the T. They, they were the zealots. They were zealous for the law. You know, you keep it. You keep it to the, to the, to the max. Okay? <clears throat> now it goes on. Observance of the law. That this may indeed be the case is enhanced by the fact that visible signs of the kingdom's arrival were indeed present. And that's why I went ahead and explained a little bit more of the context of the passage. The Samaritan leper had just been healed. 
Here are the signs. Here is the ocular, the natural eye evidence that the kingdom of God is present. And man cannot recognize the signs. Impossible with man. Jesus said it himself. Impossible with man. <clears throat> There's another uh, place where Jesus asks his disciples, who do the multitudes, uh, who do men say that I am? Well, they start giving their, their responses. Well, some say the, that prophet or that one that was to come or uh, Jeremiah or, or one, of the, one of the prophets, or, or, you know, going on and on with what the multitudes say. And then so he kind of narrows it down and asks, okay, well, you guys, you, just, you disciples, you who are with me all the time, who do you say that I am? And see, <clears throat> during that time, Jesus is not a part of this first creation. No, no. His Father is God. His Father is not the first man, Adam, like all of the rest of humanity. No, 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 no. His Father is God. So he's asking his disciples, who are in the same state and condition as the multitudes and as the Gentiles and as everybody else. Well, who do you say that I am? And Peter, we, we know this, Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus rejoiced because basically Jesus says this, flesh and blood, your heritage, your lineage, your source, the natural mind, didn't reveal this to you. You could not come unto this understanding, unto this declaration, by your ability, by man's ability. But my Father in heaven has revealed it unto you. Now at that point, it is unto, it is from without. And we do know that after the death, death, burial, and resurrection, there did come a time where this very same one, Christ himself, was revealed of the Father in Peter. And we see his confession of that concerning uh, the glory from the Holy Mount and the more sure word of prophecy. Okay? <clears throat> and so, where were we? Yes. Uh, once again, let me read that. That, uh, that New Testament Greek-English Dictionary of the Complete Biblical Library in the New Testament for the New Testament usage. Luke chapter 17, verse 20 is the only New Testament passage to use parateresis. Parateresis. Uh, one, forgive me on my accent there, uh, one possible point being made that there is that even careful observations of visible events will not reveal the coming of God's kingdom. Perhaps, however, a pun is being made on parateresis. Uh, it may also suggest that the kingdom does not come through observance of the law, because once again the Pharisees were quite strict in their observances of the law. That, that this may indeed be the case is enhanced by the fact that visible signs of the kingdom's arrival were indeed present. The Samaritan leper had just been healed. And <clears throat> I, I was thinking about this this morning, and the, the Jews had an expectation of the Messiah when he would come. Of course, their expectation wasn't how Jesus came, but not only that, within Christ himself is the kingdom, wherein he is, he brings with himself everything that God has ever promised, the kingdom, righteousness, peace, all, all this, but it is hidden in a person. Cannot be found apart from him. I'll, I'll give you the example, life, life, eternal life, eternal life, is hidden in the person of Christ. And what I mean by that, Jesus himself is, is life. And what I mean by that is basically this. To find eternal life, you cannot find it apart from the Son. But man wants to find eternal life apart from the Son. And that's impossible because 
everything of God is hidden to the natural mind. The mind cannot know it. The mind cannot perceive it. The eye cannot perceive. The ear cannot hear. Nor the mind comprehend. No. This mind, the, first, the mind of the first man, Adam, cannot, cannot attain unto the eternal mind, the mind of Christ. Right? <clears throat> and so everything, I mean, that's why Jesus rejoiced when Peter declared such a statement, such a true statement, because he knew it didn't come from Peter. He, he knew that it didn't come from the source of humanity or humanity's source. Right. So now going on with another uh, another uh, dictionary. This is the New International Dictionary Dictionary of New Testament Theology, the abridged edition, for the same word observation. Uh, it says observation uh, classical in Old Testament. In the classical Greek, it goes on to say this right here: parateresis is used only for observance of legal demands. So that's spelling it out. This, this particular dic dic dictionary is saying this is concerning the observance of legal demands. And so it's not going to be by the keeping of the law. You're not going, like what as this definition is stating, or this uh, dictionary is stating, to to know the kingdom will not be by the keeping of the law. The keeping of the law will not bring you to a point where you can recognize the coming of the kingdom. That's basically what that's saying. And it goes on uh, with the New Testament. Under the second definition, it says, the reference of parathesis, parathesis, uh, careful observation, in Luke chapter 17, verse 20, cannot be established with certainty. And now they're basically saying we can't really point it down or pinpoint it. Uh, probably the word is used of the observation of apocalyptic signs. There is, however, the possibility that a keeping of the law is intended. And so they kind of, I, I like how right here, they just kind of leave it open. And I like that. They don't really make it concrete. They leave it open. And I'm going to interject my own thought, my own comment on this. They leave it. Now, I don't know why they did that, but I'm going to state why I believe they did that. Well, not why they did that, but why it's done. <laughs> I believe it is left open like that so that the Spirit of God can bring a heart unto Christ, whether that be by coming to realize that it's not by observe, observation of apocalyptic signs, or whether that be uh, that a heart come to realize that it is not by the keeping of the law where one recognizes the kingdom. But I would say the following. Jesus rejoiced when Peter confessed that he was the Messiah, the King, the very one who would bring in himself the kingdom. Jesus rejoiced in that. <clears throat> All right, so this is the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. This is the Kittle Complete 10 volume. Same word, I haven't moved on yet. Luke chapter 17, verse 20. Uh, Thus means that whether the kingdom of God has already come cannot be decided on the basis of events which intimate and anticipate, basically, which imply or hint on and anticipate the final consummation as though the desire for ration, ra, rationally, excuse me, the desire for rationally reasonable or logical means, basically the natural mind, and empirically accessible signs and proofs could be satisfied therewith. Mouthful. In the measure that the divine dominion is already at work, it can be known and grasped. I like what they say right here. Look at this. This is... In the measure that the divine dominion is already at work, acknowledging that Christ himself 
that the kingdom comes with the king himself, the Messiah, it can be known and grasped, grasped only by faith, with the acknowledgement of who Christ is, of who Jesus, the Son of Man, is. I like that. I mean, they spell that out beautifully. The saying is one, it goes on, the saying is one of the synoptic statements um, concerning the mystery of the kingdom of God, which is not accessible to the Pharisaic demand for signs. And so that's basically a little bit of what we've been kind of looking at. The Pharisees demanding a sign. What sign will you show us? Sign, sign, sign. They want a sign. They want a sign. And here's Jesus. I mean, I think it's the, I think it's the Gospel of John. And he says, he doesn't say these miracles. He says these signs. You know, of all the things Jesus did, John, by the unction of the Holy Spirit, presents particular signs. And he basically says this, these signs are here so that you may know that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. And in knowing, you may believe. I think it's like John chapter 21, something like that. He basically sums it up. All these signs are serving a purpose to direct and bring unto a person. That's the purpose of them for the heart to repent and turn unto the Son of the living God. All right. Where were we? Read that one. Uh, Okay. Here we are. The saying is one... Oh, yeah, I just finished reading that. The saying is one of the statements concerning the mystery of the kingdom of God. I like that. The mystery... I love that. The mystery of the kingdom of God. I, I like the term mystery because basically man can't figure it out. It's a mystery to man. He doesn't know. He doesn't understand. He doesn't comprehend. As long as it's the heart submitted, well, as long as it's a person who's not born again, all they have is the, first, the mind of the first man, Adam. And for the one who's born again, if their heart is submitted unto that mind, mystery. Christ is a mystery unto that that one. The mystery of the kingdom of God, which is not accessible to the Pharisaic demands for signs. It goes on. The expression, and he gives the whole uh, Greek passage right there, parateresios, shows, and it ends with that, the word observation, parateresios, shows that the attitude of the Pharisees expressed in their messianic and eschatological expectations is quite inadequate in the face of what is effected by the coming of Jesus in the midst of his people. They had an expectation of the Messiah, and when he showed up, it didn't When he showed up, he didn't meet their expectations. They had a concept of how he would come. When he showed up, when the person himself showed up, he didn't meet their concept. Because brothers and sisters, their concept, my concept, come, your concept, our concept comes from a natural mind the mind of the first man, Adam. The mind which is completely blind and ignorant to the eternal mind of God. Do you see, this is why Jesus rejoiced so much when Peter confessed that he was the Son of the living God. When Peter confessed that he was the Messiah. That's why Jesus rejoiced so much because he knew that it was not of this creation. He knew that it was not of this condition. Because with man, it's impossible. It requires a miracle of God. All right, now, let's look at that passage again. With the passage, uh, once again, Luke chapter 17, 
verse 20 was, Jesus answered the Pharisees and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Verse 21, Nor will they say, See here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. All right, I looked up the word within. It's the Greek word anthos, and it's Strong's number 1787, and it's from Strong's number 1722, the Greek word en which we have already covered in previous lessons in a different series, in Christ. And so that's from where this Greek term anthos, within you, comes from. And this is a Strong's uh, dictionary. It says, inside, adverb, or noun, translated into the English as within. This is the complete word study dictionary of the New Testament, Spiro Zodhiatz. Not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right. Uh, for the word within, anthos, Strong's number 1787. It's within, used also as a preposition with the, I guess it's genitive case, I'm not sure. G E N period, genitive, maybe. In Luke chapter 17, verse 21, exactly what, where we are finding it, it says, The kingdom of God is within you, meaning it is located in your heart and affections, not external and that's what he's saying right there and one of my one of the things that I just wanted to mention is basically this here is Jesus the king and he brings in himself everything that God has ever promised everything that God has ever declared righteousness once again righteousness peace love kingdom a new creation, a new covenant, all these terms, all these terms that are found in the scriptures. Here are the Pharisees asking him, when, I'll read it again, verse 20, now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, The kingdom of God himself was in their midst, and they didn't know it. He was right there in their midst, and they didn't know it. Think of the children of Israel when they were wandering in the wilderness. I don't think they were really, well, I'm not sure. I'm, I'd have to look it up to see if the actual term wandering is in there. But God had them 40 years in the wilderness. He didn't, he didn't forsake them. He didn't leave them. No, no, no. Within those 40 years, he was continually presenting to them signs that they may know the truth. Because they had come out of Egypt. All this in testimony. They had come out of Egypt. Pharaoh was no longer present. That mind, that government, that head was no longer present. They had gone through the door, through death. They had gone through the Red Sea, through burial, and they had come out in type and in testimony, in resurrection, and they were in the wilderness, and their hearts, it, Stephen says, and in their hearts, they went back to Egypt. Now, in reality, they were not in Egypt, but in their hearts, they went back to Egypt. And God didn't forsake them. He didn't just leave them. No. He continually presented signs for them. Signs that would direct to a reality that God himself was present in the midst. I'll give you an example. It's, almost, it's not even an example. It's just my... Uh, I don't know. This is not in the scriptures, okay? <laughs> but what if, what hypothetically, what if, you know, the children of Israel are in the wilderness <clears throat> and they go up to Moses and they say, Moses, when is the kingdom of God gonna come? You know, and all this is in, all this represents testimony. It's a testimony of the reality that came with the person of Jesus Christ. All right? Uh, Moses would probably look at them and say, you know what? The kingdom of God doesn't come with observation. You can't really... 
The kingdom of God has come because the king is in your midst. And you can't get it. You can't know it. Your heart must be directed above unto this face-to-face -face communion with the living God to know the one who is in the midst. God himself told Moses, let them build me a tabernacle that I may dwell in their midst. Now, is that for God? No, he was already there. That was for the Israelites' sake, a sign unto them to know that God was in the midst. The ta they camped around the tabernacle. The tabernacle was in the middle of the encampment of Israel. And not all Israel knew the kingdom of God was present. And once again, brothers and sisters, in testimony, the kingdom of God was present because they were led with a fire by night and a cloud by day. They were led, they were governed by the glory of God. The kingdom of God was present whether they recognized it or not. Moses knew. Moses knew. His heart didn't go back to Egypt. No. His heart continued before the face of the Lord. Moses had an unveiled face, though all the children of Israel did not. They continued with a veil over their face, over the face of their heart. <clears throat> Moses went up. The children of Israel did not. Therefore, the children of Israel continued wondering Pharaoh was not present. That kingdom that they had come out from was not present. A new kingdom ruled, reigned, and governed because the king was present. All right, going on. Within you. Uh, external. Okay, now, uh, now all that to kind of set the background uh, of, of the the context of Luke chapter 17, beginning with verse 26. Now, this is what Jesus is saying. And as it was in the days of Noah, he's going to use two examples, a first example and a second example, very specific examples. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. Verse 27, look at this. They ate, they drank. There's communion going on. They ate, they drank. Then they married wives. They were given in marriage union. It goes on. Until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So nothing happened until Noah entered the ark and then everything else was destroyed. God destroyed all of it. But with this example with Noah, there's an example concerning union. All right, he goes on, Jesus goes on. This is the second example. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, the time of Lot, they ate, they drank, oh, just like Noah, right? They had communion. <clears throat> they were communing. They ate, they drank, but now it gets a little different. They bought, they sold, they planted, they built, they labored. Basically, they labored. The goings about, they lived in, they functioned in their cities. Verse 29, but... On the day that Lot went out of Sodom, and the thing right here is that Lot didn't go out. We're going to end up reading it in Genesis chapter 19. The Lord, being merciful unto Lot, takes him by the hand and brings him out. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the day, look at the way Jesus says this, the Son of Man is revealed. Verse 
So with the first example with Noah, you have something of a union. And now with the second example with Lot, you have Jesus himself saying it'll be the same way when the Son of Man is revealed. I want you to just consider that, present it before the Lord, present it to the Holy Spirit, because I'm not going to define it. I want him to define it for you. Going on, it goes on in uh, Luke. Still Luke chapter 17, now verse 31. In that day, he who is on the housetop that is above the house and his goods, that which pertains to him, that which pertains to us, are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And just because I have been, or because I have been with reading the journey of Abraham, the journey of the heart, uh, here's my comment when I, when I saw that. Abraham and Terah's house. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord says to Abraham, come out of, well, let's go ahead and read it so I don't misquote it. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land I will show you. Your father's house. Unto a land I will show you. Out of the house of the first man, Adam, into the house of the second man, the Lord from heaven. Let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. And then here's a reference to Lot's wife now. Remember Lot's wife. She kept turning back, turning back, turning back, and she never proceeded on, which we're going to read all this in, in Genesis chapter nine, 19 as we go on. She never proceeded onward unto her life, unto her salvation. All right, it goes on. Uh, verse 33, whoever, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. And I'm just going to present this verse this way. Whoever seeks to save his life, or that which he considers to be his life, will lose the knowledge of his true life. The only life there is, Christ himself. And I'm speaking to, towards us, to us who are believers. And whoever loses his life, or his concept of life, will preserve it. His life is preserved before him. It's almost, uh, I kind of, when reading this, I kind of see the same thing going on with Peniel. Jacob, called, Jacob wrestles with the angel during the nighttime, and then it says uh, he called the name of the place Peniel because, defines Peniel, for I have seen the Lord face to face, and my life is preserved. But also with that, that which I considered my concept of life was taken away. All by one thing. And see, once again, even, even look at, the, look at the, the two examples that the Lord gives. The first one with Noah. Everything continued and was as is, as always was, like normal, until the day that Noah entered the ark. The Lord takes the initiative. The Lord presents life. The Lord presents salvation. Job defines the spiritual order. The Lord giveth, and in having given, he taketh away. God does not come like a thief. God is not a thief, and God is not a robber. He does not take away. No, he gives, and in his giving, what is not of value is taken away. Example, for the one who is not born again. God does not try to come 
taking away someone's death. No. God comes presenting, giving the condition of life. Christ himself offering life, the gift of life, unto a soul that a soul may receive life. By the work of the Holy Spirit, when the heart finally responds to the voice of the living God and is able by the Spirit of God to receive, to be obedient unto the voice and receive life, immediately the condition of death is taken away. Because, of the, con because the condition of life, who Christ himself is, is present. In like manner, for the believer, the born-again believer who has life, God does not come trying to take away our concepts, our ignorance, our darkness. Remember Lot? The Lord appeared to him in the evening. No. God presents light. Now, the light of life. Remember, the Lord brought him out of Sodom. And when Lot was no longer in Sodom, then, then, Sodom and Gomorrah were taken away. All right, going on. Luke chapter 17, verse 31. I tell you, in, I tell you, in that night there will be two in one bed, the one will be taken and the other will be left. And two will be grinding together, the one will be taken and the other left. Two will be in the field, the one will be taken and the other left. And so basically, someone's heart is prepared for the coming of the Lord, for the coming of the kingdom of God, for the Son of Man being revealed, and someone's heart is not prepared. It's basically all that is, as far as those verses go, I believe. Now, uh, of course, our last mention of Lot in the New Testament is 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 through 8, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. Now, verse 8, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. And I know we compared and contrasted Abraham with Lot. And basically, brothers and sisters, uh, you can see Abraham as, wow, hero of faith. You know, he's, he's mentioned in the quote-unquote chapter of faith. Uh, and then, but Lot's not there. What happened to Lot? Remember, Lot was not, Lot was no longer in the place, in the land that the Lord had brought him to. His heart was dwelling outside of the land. Therefore, in his heart, he was not serving the purpose for which the Lord had brought him to the land. And yet the Lord had brought him to the land. His heart was dwelling in ignorance somewhere else. But that did not change the reality of who How shall I say it? Of whom, who Lot's life was. Of who Lot's righteousness was. God the Father knows the Son. No man knows the Son but the Father, and no man knows the Father but the Son, and unto him, unto whom he will reveal, will reveal him. Regardless of what Lot knew, God knows the truth because God knows the Son. Therefore, in the scriptures we read, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, righteous Lot. The only thing, brothers and sisters, is that Lot did not serve the purpose of the Lord in his generation. And in fact, pretty much after Genesis chapter 19, we really don't hear of Lot anymore, except that he shows up every once in a while concerning his descendants or the sons of Lot. And, of course, in the New Testament passages that we just finished reading. <clears throat> now, I, look, I, I went ahead and defined the name. No, I didn't define it, but I looked the definition up for the name Lot. And this was almost like just out of curiosity. And uh, so I did that. And this is, uh, 
I pulled it from Genesis chapter 11, verse 27. Lot, and I'll read the verse. This is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begat Lot. And Lot is Strong's number 3876. This is the Strong's Dictionary. It says the same as Strong's number 3875. He goes on to say Lot, Abraham's nephew, translated into the English as Lot. Now, it's the same as Strong's number 3875, and that definition says the following. It is from Strong's number 3874. It's kind of like going dink, dink, dink. <laughs> but this one, Strong's number 3875, the definition is a veil, translated into the English as covering. Strong's number 3874 is a primitive root to wrap up, cast, wrap. This is the online Bible Hebrew lexicon for the word lot, Strong's number 3876, covering. This is the Complete Word Study Dictionary of the Old Testament, Baker and Carpenter, for the word lot, the name lot, Strong's number 3876, a proper noun designating lot. And remember, it's the same as Strong's number 3875, so I looked that Strong's number up in that same dictionary, and this is what it says, a masculine noun indicating a shroud, a covering. It goes on, it is found, uh, oh, excuse me, it is the noun for Strong's number 3874, basically what the Strong's definition said, it's here, it's the same as this, and this one is from this one. It says, indicating the inability, look at this, <laughs> <clears throat> the scriptures are one continuous thread that declare Christ. Indic this is just a dictionary, but listen to this, indicating the inability of a people to perceive God and his works clearly. exactly what Jesus himself told the Pharisees. They could not perceive the king, therefore they could not perceive his kingdom. They give an example of Isaiah chapter 25 verse 7, which we'll read in a second. It goes on, in this verse, Isaiah uses the noun and verb forms together, meaning the covering that covers that covers or the shroud that enfolds. That is a reference to the power of Christ's redemptive work to open the eyes of the blind. Brothers and sisters, the reason, the purpose for the eyes of the blind to be opened are to behold only one. And that's it. Stephen, if you continue reading on in Acts chapter 7, he says, I see the heavens opened. Well, let's, let's look at that. I'll, 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 skip, I'll skip Isaiah for right now, but we'll get back to Isaiah. Let's, let's read. what Stephen declares. <laughs> I love this. Look at this. It's Acts chapter 7. <laughs> oh, this is just... Ah. Acts chapter 7. Let's start with verse 54. After Stephen has been declaring Christ from the Scriptures and basically saying, you know, you guys... Oh, where does it say? You, you have, please, at, 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 at your liberty, read the whole chapter 7. This is one who is indeed, listen, filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the proof of one being filled with the Holy Spirit. He sees Christ, therefore he sees Christ in the Scriptures. He sees the testimony of Christ in the Scripture given of God. Which are the testimony of Christ? Okay, this is verse 51. After he declares Christ throughout all the Old Testament, well, I can't say throughout all the Old Testament, but through spots where he picks from the Old Testament, he says this, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. 
Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, Christ himself, the Messiah, the Son of God, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received by the law, by the direction of angels, and have not kept it. Had they truly kept the law, they would have received the one whom the law declares. Verse 54. They didn't see, they didn't see the Son of God as the object of the law. They didn't see Christ as the object of the law. They saw themselves as the object of the law. Therefore, they didn't keep the law. Verse 54, when they heard these things, oh, look at this. Here's, well, here you go. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. That's exactly, I mean, can, can Stephen do that? Can, listen, can Stephen actually touch a person's heart? I would say no. That would be as absurd as man, by man's ability, controlling the winds and the waves or man by man's ability controlling nature. Like some would say that the prophet Elisha commanded bears to devour delinquent youth. No, no, no. Does man have that ability over nature? No, God. All man can do is touch the outside. That's all I can do. That's all you can do. That's all we can do. God, brothers and sisters, touches the heart. I remember Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. The words were not his. Going on. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. Of course. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, look at that. <laughs> This is the definition of being full of the Holy Spirit. Gazed into heaven, here we go, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. That's it. That's it. When your eyes are opened, it is for one purpose, to behold the Son. Nothing less. Every single miracle sign wonder, the signs are working, are designed of God unto that very end. Let me jot this uh, down before... wasn't in my notes. Before I forget it, let's see. Where did we start? Verse 51. But read the whole entire chapter. It's, it's beautiful. Through verse 56. He was just declaring what he was seeing. And what he was seeing was Jesus, the Son of Man. The same one who came, whom they rejected. All right, now, Isaiah chapter 25, verse 7, and he will destroy in this mountain, masculine singular, mountain, the surface of the covering cast over, look, listen to this, all the people. Not some, no, no, no. This, this veil... This veil is over, this covering is over all the people. And the veil that is spread over all the nations. But it's only in this mountain, Mount Zion, which we will, we will look at where the veil is taken away. The Apostle Paul declaring, but the veil is taken away in Christ.
jotting it down, it wasn't in my notes. Because as long as our hearts, we who are born again, as long as our hearts are submitted unto a natural mind of the first man, Adam, there's a veil. Because that mind, brothers and sisters, is below. It's not the eternal mind. That mind, that mind cannot attain unto the eternal mind, the mind of God, the mind of Christ. It cannot. It cannot. What eye hath not seen, what ear hath not heard, nor has it entered into the mind, into the heart of man, that which God prepared for them who love him. But he has revealed it unto us. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the unique, uniquely the only Son, the only begotten Son of God, is a mystery to the natural mind. Cannot be known, cannot be known. Therefore, everything, all that He brings in His own person can neither be known. The question from the beginning, when will the kingdom of God come? The kingdom of God does not come with observation. It can be known, it can be observed, it can be understood by the natural senses. <clears throat> I'll just read that passage again from the complete Word Study Dictionary of the Old Testament. Uh, Indicating a masculine noun, Strong's number 3875, indicating, or, or a masculine noun indicating a shroud, a covering. It is the noun for Strong's number 3874, indicating the inability of people to perceive God and his works clearly. Their reference, once again, Isaiah 25 7. In this verse, Isaiah uses the noun and verb forms together, meaning the covering and the covers or the shroud that enfolds. This is a reference to the power of Christ's redemptive work to open the eyes of the blind. Oh, I printed the verse. Totally forgot it. There you go. <laughs> I actually had the verse printed here in my notes. Here we go, I'll put an arrow to it. All right, the last uh, dictionary, the last lexicon is the ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible. Uh, so it basically says cover, veil, and uh, defines it as, and this is from Strong's number 3875, which is the same, once again, or excuse me, where, where, how did the Strong's define it? 3876 is the same as Strong's number 3875, okay? The same, basically the same, same term. It says, the cover, but listen to what he says here, cover, veil. And then he goes on to say the following, the covering that covers and hides the face of a woman. I thought about that, and you probably just thought about that as well. It's like, whoa! And here is my final statement. The husband is the only one with authority to remove the veil. My brothers and sisters, the name of Lot means veil. His whole walk was a veiled walk in ignorance of the place unto which he had been brought, unto the household he had been brought unto but because he knew not, because he saw not, he tried to find his purpose outside of the place, outside of the house, finding it in a place that he chose, not the place that God chose, no, in the place that Lot chose, and in Lot's own house. Now with all that, brothers and sisters, with all that 
with the veil and everything else, God the Father knows the truth. Therefore, the Apostle Peter can declare righteous lot. He declares the eternal mind. The only difference between, basically, with, with looking at these passages here, these chapters here, between Abraham and Lot, they were both brought unto purpose, they were both brought unto the place, but only Abraham served the purpose of the Lord in his generation. Lot did not. Therefore, Lot was not in the enjoyment, listen, of his true inheritance. Lot continued in a false enjoyment of what he thought his inheritance was. So please, please, please present all of this to the Holy Spirit, our true teacher, that the Spirit of God would take that which he desires to take, even if, if he desires to take anything from this class or not, but to use whatever he desires to use for God's end and God's purpose, for God's will in our hearts. Amen? Amen. Lord bless. We'll see you in our next class. Oh, yes, and an, annou an announcement. <laughs> I forgot to make the announcement at the beginning of the class. We are, CMI, we are having our summer Bible conference June 22nd through the 26th. I always forget announcements. <laughs> we are having it. So uh, those are the dates. If, if you need to contact us, uh, that's a good question. Email somebody. <laughs> Email. Email via Raven or Brother Lumen. Lord bless. We'll see you in our next class. Amen.